traveling through the Scottish Highlands, you can't help but feel the dramatic power of nature and the history of this wild landscape. Blair Castle has commanded a strategic position on the route north through the Highlands since the 13th century. And it's here in the 1840s that Queen Victoria first fell in love with the beauty of the Scottish Highlands. Blair Castle is everything you imagine a Scottish castle to be. Its architecture is the epitome of the Scottish baronial style with its fairy tale turrets and crenellations. And inside, there's a dazzling array of Georgian splendor. Oh my goodness, I mean it is, it's just exquisite. With a treasure trove of history stored in the attics. It's the oldest Scottish whiskey in the world. It was yes. the same whiskey that Queen Victoria drank. Yes. When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband, Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Living in a place like this is a joy, but also a challenge. And every day we're aware that we're preserving a very special part of Britain's heritage. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. So if you love castles and manors and stately homes as much as I do, please join this American Viscountess as I journey into the British countryside in search of some of Britain's finest historic houses. Blair Castle is the ancestral home of the Atoll family. Today, the castle and the 120,000 acre estate are managed by Sarah Troughton, alongside her son, Bertie, who has promised to give me a tour of the interiors. Hi, Judy. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm very well. Thank oh you so much for coming. Goodness, Come thank you so much for having me. And Ooh. Okay, so let's start from the beginning here, Bertie. I've just arrived. This is the main entrance to the castle, is that right? Yep, the main entrance to the castle, and as you kind of saw outside, very much the Victorian, Scots baronial style yes. of castellations, and this is one of the few rooms that the public will see that was also a later addition. Okay. So this is an 1870 room. The building is an evolving story. Yes. But the interiors are majority uh, Georgian. Georgian. And really spectacular Georgian interiors, but with this is a Victorian edition. Right. And, um, and so the baronial, obviously Victorian baronial style here that I see on the outside, how did that come to be? This was then what you're saying, a Georgian house, if you like. Yeah, it, partly through the employment of, an, of David Bryce as an architect who was employed throughout the 1860s and 1870s to create a more exciting Victorian fairy tale castle okay. appearance. Right. Because after the Jacobite um, wars of 1745 and all the political turmoil, the castle up to that point had very much been a castle. This was the last okay. castle ever to be under siege in the UK. And Politically, the family wanted to just be like, we're not going to cause you any trouble. We're very low-key people. So the, how, the castle became Athol House, which was ah. a very dull Georgian facade. Okay. And then mid-19th century, uh, the railway arrived, new slug of money, uh, right, friendships right. with the royals, yes. always trying to keep up with Queen Victoria. <laughs> you know, the usual story. Yes, yes. So then it was all about castellations and aggrandizement of the castle. Yes. And that's what you see outside, but you also see in this room. 
Okay, um, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But uh, I'll take you up the main staircase. We'll go into the dining room and have a look in there. Blair Castle welcomes over 140,000 visitors each year, with 30 rooms in the castle open to the public. I could not wait to explore. So Julie, this is the tea room. Um, and there's a, we've got a big fan display in here at the moment because um, we were just amused by this idea of Georgians and even Victorians as well, sitting around having their tea, flirting with their fans. Right. Um, so different movements would mean different things. What? <laughs> so if you yeah. were, you know, you might be sitting there having your tea, some chap over here might be trying to chat you up, <gasps> but you would be having none of it and would be closing your fan and putting it to your right cheek, which no. would be like, enough with you, I'm engaged. Like, no. be, be gone. Or you might open it and coyly play, play with your other hand, which might be, oh, I'm interested, you know. Let's oh talk, my let's talk later. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but then if your next meal would be in here, in, right. the, in the dining room. Um, oh. And oh, it's exquisite. Georgian again, yes. Georgian again. And Georgian. all this plaster work throughout that castle took about 10 years from 1740s and 1750s. And they spent a huge amount on the interiors after the 1745 uprising, mm. when the exterior of the castle was made as dull as possible. They right. made the interior as lavish as possible. Yes. Um, Thomas Clayton, was he was called the, the plasterer, and he was also doing Holyrood Palace at the same time. Was he? Oh my goodness. I mean, it is, it's just exquisite. And then I guess this, these were two outfits owned by the sixth Duke and Duchess. Mm. So that's sort of 1860s. Um, they were the ones that were great friends of the Queen Victoria. Yes, yes. And this is what they would have worn. Um, to with dinner. Tiny waist. Yeah, I actually could have eaten anything. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> exactly. Do you, you know, ever use the dining room? Christmas, big parties? Um, <laughs> well, it's it's a hundred meters away from the nearest kitchen, <gasps> so is it really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not very practical. But occasionally we clear the table away and have a big party in here. Right. Okay. Or, so it is used. Yeah, and all these paintings are of scenes from around the estate. Wonderful. Well, it's absolutely exquisite. And, you know, the Georgians just did know how to do interiors, didn't they? Mm, yeah, it's a good room. Yeah, very good. The exquisite dress on display in the dining room is one of a number featured throughout these rooms, each with their own beautiful story to tell. <gasps> <laughs> Bertie, oh my goodness. So this is the drawing room? This is the drawing room. And these, we've got three um, dresses on display here, dating from the Jacobite era. So this one is about 1750, just mm. afterwards, which would have been roughly when this room was done up to be like this. Up until 1500s, 1600s, it would have been part of a, a banqueting hall. Okay. And then, you know, the Georgians got, got at it and really went for it. And then the, the last dress over here is from the Queen Victoria era. So the sixth Duchess would have worn this. And if you look very closely, it's, it's actually made out of, um, we think about 5,000 beetle wings. What? <laughs> what? No. Oh my goodness. It was up in the attics for a good hundred years, all in uh, tissue paper with just a label with my grandmother had written costumes on it. And it was, right. So we only recently what got them all out. a find. And we can only have them on display for a, you know, a couple of years max. Right. And then we'll have to put them back into the tissue paper yeah. and conserve them. Yes. It's obviously an amazing room, but it also epitomizes this idea of uh, Georgian hosting and hospitality. Mm. This room in particular tells the story of the fourth Duke and Duchess. Right. And the fourth Duke would fit in very well at, at Mapperton. He was known for planting trees. He was known oh. as the planting Duke. Okay. He planted yes. about 20 million, we think. Um, so yeah, well, mostly Wait. on the southern bit of the estate from Dunkeld You're kidding me. all the way up, yeah. He planted about 20 million trees. Predominantly large trees. Wow. I can also see dotted around lots of sort of the coronets showing off, you know, yes, 
they were powerful and mighty and here's our coronet. And, and here's our marble. I think they're also saying is that the marble on these tops um, and around the castle, this beautiful kind of greeny gray marble is all from the, lo from the local river, the River Tilt. Right, so they didn't, you know, head on over to Carrara. And, and <laughs> <laughs> no need, no need. No need, you have it right here. Who knew that you had marble right here? That quite exquisite marble right mm. here in Scotland. Well, Blair Athol is, on, is the, known as the gateway to the Highlands. Yes. And part of that is a big geological shift. Right, where yes, Where marble yes. is then made. Well, absolutely exquisite. And so again, I have to ask, do you use this as well? Definitely, this room gets used um, for drinks receptions mm. quite a lot. The furniture is, is too precious. Right. Um, so it's so, is moved out, but then it is a big entertaining space. Okay. Have you ever dreamed of staying in one of the UK's grand castles or stately homes with a group of family or friends? When I lived in America, it was always a dream of mine. The UK is brimming with them. There's a treasure trove of rich history, royal connections, and extraordinary stories. The allure of joining this world was irresistible. Fast forward to today, and I've ended up living in one of these remarkable homes. I realize that I've been lucky. However, even if that hadn't happened, I could still have made my dream come true with the help of Storied Collection, and now you can too. Storied Collection offers exclusive hire of private estates and castles across the United Kingdom and Ireland, where the historical significance and legacy of each property are carefully preserved. And guess what? Mapperton is now officially a member of Storied Collection too. The historic houses in Storied Collection have been meticulously selected to provide the highest standards of accommodation and service, as well as unforgettable stories. Moreover, they offer a range of experiences, whether you're an avid fisherman, a golf enthusiast, or simply someone who delights in owner-guided tours. So if you're planning a large family gathering or a thrilling adventure with friends, a retreat with business colleagues, or perhaps your wedding, you can now make it happen in one of these homes, and it's much more affordable than you think. With an extraordinary variety of castles, manors, and stately homes available, this truly is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so don't let it slip away. Mention Julie when booking for £1,000 off any stay five nights or longer. So click the link in the description down below to discover and book the historic house of your dreams. To hear more about some of the key moments of history here at Blair Castle, I met up with Sarah Troughton in the private library. What is, of course, so beautiful about Blair Castle is not just the house itself, it's a beautiful castle, but where it is. This atmosphere of the highland, the landscape, I mean, it's idyllic, it's so beautiful. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the first bit of the castle was built in um... 1269, so right. that was a long time ago. And it was built where it was built because of the landscape, because this is where the Strath or wider valley um, becomes narrower. Okay. As it and becomes Glengarry, Gary being the river. Yes. And so in defensive terms, whoever controlled this spot controlled the gateway to the highlands. It's played a major part in history. It's sighting over the years, Bonnie Prince Charlie, army on his the retreat north to Culloden was stationed here for a while the Duke absented himself as a he was a Hanoverian right but, right. The, but his brothers were Jacobite so there's right. a whole history there of the, the the divided family which is very typical yes when Queen Victoria visited the Highlands which I think the first time she came up was in 1842, she right. absolutely fell in love with the Highlands, which really start at Dunkeld, which is the sort of southern end of the estate. Then when she was feeling a bit weak after her second birth of her second child, she decided to ask the Duke and Duchess if she could take over their house. 
And they had a very, very private visit here, which was exactly what she wanted. But the Duchess and Queen Victoria became very good friends and remained very close for the rest of her life. The Duchess was um, her, the mistress of the, the bedchamber, which right. was the sort of highest yes, point no, no, of in, her house, in her household. Duchess Anne is one of a long line of impressive women at Blair Castle. As a girl growing up here, Sarah remembers meeting Kitty, the eighth Duchess, in her apartments. I can remember her. I was probably about 12 when she died. Okay. And I remember her as a charming old lady who could play the piano and would play anything I asked her to play on it. But before that, she'd been a very formidable lady when she married the Duke, she was training to be a concert pianist and right. would have been a concert pianist. And she trained in Germany, and spoke oh German my... fluently. Um, and what, so roughly what period are we at right now? Well, she, they married in 1899. Right. So she would have been training in the very end of the 19th century. Oh my goodness. Um, because she married, the, he was the Marquis of Tully Barden then, but he was going to be the Duke. She gave up her career as a concert pianist and supported him and actually never had any children. I think she just wasn't able to have children, which was a sadness. Right. Um, but she made the most of her time and she took up all sorts of good causes and then became quite political. And she became the first female MP in Scotland. And then she became the first ever female minister of state. She was minister of state of education. And so she had a very, so, very, a, a sort of good political career. But when, um, in the 30s, when Hitler was first coming to power, she read, much earlier than most British people, she read his book Mein Kampf in German because she was so fluent in German. It was just yes. as easy for her to read it in German. And she realized how very, very dangerous the Nazis were at that stage. So when Chamberlain went through appeasement and all that, she gave up the Conservative whip. I Along see. with, actually, Winston Churchill. But then Winston Churchill went back to the Conservative side, and she yes, didn't. Yes. So when the next election came along, she um, had to stand as an independent. And then she didn't. And she, she didn't get, get a seat. I mean, right. she ne very, very nearly retained it. She was a very highly intelligent lady. Um, and, a, and a very determined lady. She was petite. <laughs> she right. was very, very small. <laughs> and she took no truck from Small anyone. but mighty, small yeah, but mighty. Small but mighty. And in the meantime, she's married to the eighth Duke, is that right? Yes. I mean, he was a very successful soldier up until towards the end of the First World War when his father died and he actually became the Duke. Right. He then returned to Blair and his, I think his primary concern was the estate. He was very well liked. He was obviously a very nice man. He wasn't a very efficient estate manager. Okay. The estate was in a lot of debt when he inherited it. And his every attempt he made to get it out of debt was a failure, basically. Right, right. Oh dear. And so in the in the thirties he went bankrupt. Right. Oh. Um, but he was rescued by my great grandmother. So it was he was never actually had to declare bankruptcy. Oh my goodness. So that was lucky. The 20th century was a century of challenge and uncertainty for Blair Castle. But it was the women of the family who led the way in ensuring the survival of the castle and estate for the future. The pioneer was really my great-grandmother. She insisted that it was her company that ran the place, and they got the house ready to open to the public, oh which they did goodness. in 1936. In 1936? Yes, it so was that... one of the very first ones to open. The eighth Duchess, Kitty, lived here mm. on this floor. And at the far end of the castle, the ninth Duke, who was a bachelor, her brother-in-law, mm. lived. And then in what's known as the South End, my family lived. Okay. My mother and my half-brother and right. The sort of odd menage a toi. <laughs> <laughs> you never knew at any mealtime when I was a child who might or might not turn up for it. 
How brilliant. Um, yeah. But anyway, so, they all got along and my mother yeah. ran the show. She was, she was the one who was in charge. Right. She, she, was a she was a very, very practical businesswoman, so she, she got things sorted out. Right. Looking to the future, I'm always really interested as a you know, fellow historic house owner, we're here as the custodians in order to make sure that these places survive for those future generations. And is that something, Sarah, that you do think about? Yes, it is. I think I put it into two categories. Um, there's one is the history, the castle, the artifacts, you know, all that sort of thing that has to be preserved mm. at all cost. But, you know, it takes money to keep the roof yes, on. Yes, yes. So it obviously, does. <laughs> I'm very pleased to have a lot of visitors. <laughs> but um, then there's the other side of the, thing, of the business, which is much more business orientated. Mm. And you make sure that that's going to. Um, make enough money to keep the infrastructure of the place going, um, to provide decent jobs for people, as well as supporting the castle. I never think, shall we do the roof or shall we build a farm building? Right. The farm building has to pay for the farm building. Right. The roof has to be done however you get the money, <laughs> <laughs> even if you take it off, you know, another successful part of the business. So true. And I mean, there's a big reward too in seeing happy visitors and people, you know, I, I often walk through the rooms just as if I was a tourist. Yes, yes. Know, to visit her sort of look. And I really get quite a kick actually out of when I hear somebody discuss how lovely something is yes. or how well displayed it is or, you know, you get, yeah. you get nice feedback. You do, you do. Well, I'm a happy visitor. Well, I mean, what a wonderful, special place, but I'm a very happy visitor here. So thank Good. you. Good, well, I'm they glad. <laughs> The attics at Blair Castle are off limits to visitors, but Bertie kindly agreed to show me the treasure trove of family history stored in the Warren of Rooms. Absolute heaven for me. Um, so Julie, this is a section of the attics. Um, there's probably over 60 rooms what? of, att no. of attics. <laughs> What's amazing about these attics when you go to these historic houses, now this is history. Look at this. It's wonderful, isn't it? We're now on the top third section of the attic. These are the furniture rooms. This looks like chaos, but I, I assure no, you, it is. No, it doesn't. It, I, I, it doesn't look we know, like chaos. We know what's going it on in like here. It looks like going into an antiques furniture. Yeah, exactly. This um, is just brilliant, Bertie. You'll love these bits around here. Um, so, Julie, this room is quite good at um, giving you a picture of the how the castle sort of operated in the 19th century. Right. So this is how all the rooms would have been lit, <gasps> through these little gas-fired lights and bulbs. These ones as well? Yeah, even oh, the little ones. They're beautiful. They're really cool. Yeah. And then in, in about 1905, we built a hydro power station, and then in 1951, the castle went on to mains, mains electricity. Right, mains electricity, so de right. So decommissioned that. So this would have been throughout the probably the Victorian era. Yes. This is exactly how everything would have been lit. Right. And I mean, it's just interesting to see how, of course, right here, just in this room, you can actually visualize how the castle has evolved mm. to modern day electricity and yeah. looking what it was, you know, during the Victorian era and where we are today. You know, although there's a lot of things up here, all the best stuff is obviously downstairs yes. and open to the public. Yes. But, you know, we can't show everything the no. whole time. So it's that <laughs> balance between conserving some stuff, showing stuff, yes. and keeping the stories fresh and interesting. But I guess it also gives you that opportunity to sort of change it up on what you're displaying um, for Definitely. the public. Um, well, Julie, I think you'll like it in this room because um, it's full of obscure old <gasps> treasures. Yes. He's got everything from a cannon wheel, old whiskey stills, 
to pots and pans, to traveling chests. There's quite <laughs> nice old telephones in here. There certainly are. <laughs> so you could have a whole telephone exhibition. <laughs> we should. Don't you think so? This is, this is incredible. The castle was the, the first building in the area to get a telephone. So you'd call up the operator and you'd say, um, just give me number one. Right, you know, right, right, <laughs> right, 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 Athel, right, right. And it was the only line <laughs> and it would come through here. Hi there, just calling from Blair Castle in Scotland. I'm just wondering if you could connect me to Mapperton in West Dorset. Connecting you now, madam. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. So there's, <laughs> there's so many things in here, Julie. We've got um, Duchess Louise's medicine um, cabinet in there. Can I, can I? Yeah, oh, go for oh, it. Okay. <gasps> Thank you. I feel very honored. I'm clutching this little trumpet, which I yeah, should it's, put back. It's, it's quite sweet. It's really sweet. Look at this. This is unbelievable. <gasps> no. Wait. So your kind of Victorian ailments would have been... There. Yeah. Look at that. I wonder what's in there. Yeah, I know. These, this is incredible. This is absolutely beautiful. Look at the velvet there and the leather case. It's beautiful. <gasps> mm. I this is, I bet you like that one. Okay, this says, last gentleman, please close the box. Okay, what is this box? It's a party box. Oh, it is, wow. <laughs> Look at gin, whiskey, sherry, brandy. I mean, whiskey is sort of the drink of yeah, Scotland, the, isn't it? Not only or, Scotland, but, but Black Castle is the home of Keepers of the Quake, which oh. is the um, world um, you know, mecca of whiskey. Quake is the wonderful little silver bowl that you drink whiskey from. Okay. And houses like Blair would have made their own whiskey. We always knew that we had this very old whiskey in the cellars. Okay. And we recently sent it off to be carbon dated because we wow. had the, the plaques and the signs with it saying it was um, from 1841. And um, we tasted, my dad and I drank it and it was amazing. <gasps> and we sent it off and it's come back carbon dated as, yep, it's authentic. So we think it's the oldest Scottish whiskey in the world. And, you know, Queen Victoria was coming and staying in 1844. So we're pretty sure that when Dad and I were tasting this whiskey, it was yes. the same whiskey that Queen Victoria drank. Yes, this is my favorite <laughs> find so far. And if there's any left, we'll have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly will. So only 60 more rooms to show you. Okay. <laughs> I could have spent all day exploring those attics, but with so much more to see, I headed out into the landscape to hear about some of the nature restoration projects on the estate. You're really helping and aiding in this recovery of nature. Absolutely, that's what it's about, yeah. And the Highland cattle helped me conquer my fear of cows. We'll be absolutely fine. You're just going to leave me here. I'll come back in the morning. <laughs> You'll still be here. I absolutely love traveling up and down and across the UK to film at some of these most astonishing historic houses. But I'm only able to do that because of the support of our patrons. So if you are enjoying this program and these high quality productions, do consider becoming an American Viscountess patron. Here you'll get early access to all of the episodes. They're ad free as well. Plus you'll get American Viscountess merchandise, Christmas cards, and a community who also loves stately homes, manors, and castles as much as you do and as much as I do. So do check it out. Details down below.